everyone, it's Sarah Fredster, NurseRN.com, and in this video, I'm going to be going over chronic kidney disease, also known as chronic renal failure. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the renal system. And as always, don't forget to take the free quiz that you can access at the end of this video. So let's get started. First, let's start out talking about what is chronic kidney disease. It is where you have a significant decrease in renal function. And this happens over a long period of time and it is irreversible. Now that is the complete opposite of whenever we talked about in the previous lecture about acute kidney injury. Remember that was a sudden decrease in renal function and it tends to be reversible if they can figure out the cause and treat it appropriately. Now let's look at our kidney and we're gonna look specifically at the nephron because whenever we're talking about a decrease in renal function, we're really talking about this glomerulus and how it is filtering, specifically the glomerular filtration rate or GFR. So we'll be using that term a lot, GFR, because if you can understand the GFR, everything else tends to make sense. Okay, so the kidney, the functional unit of your kidney that actually produces urine are the nephrons. And in each kidney, you have millions of these nephrons and their whole goal is to filter our blood that it receives from the heart. And the glomerulus is the structure that does that. So it filters all these substances such as water ions, which are like your electrolytes, bicarb, things like that, urea and creatinine which are waste products. And remember, urea is a waste product from protein breakdown in the liver, and creatinine is a waste product from the breakdown of muscle. So it filters that. Now, the glomerulus does not filter proteins and blood cells. You should not find that in your filtrate unless your glomerulus is messed up. And here, your glomerulus is messed up. So we can probably expect to find that and it drips down into Bowman's capsule, and then it's gonna go down through the renal tubules. And the renal tubules are, in a sense, what they're gonna do is they're just gonna tweak that filtrate because the filtrate was created by the glomerulus and it's gonna take what the body needs to maintain homeostasis. So it's gonna reabsorb the amounts of water you need. It's gonna reabsorb a little bit of urea and it's gonna reabsorb our electrolytes that we need. However, it is not going to reabsorb creatinine. So let's talk about creatinine for a second. So creatinine is that waste product and it's solely filtered by that glomerulus from the bloodstream. And it's not gonna be reabsorbed in that renal tubule. So that's why we care so much about creatinine when we measure it in the urine and in the blood because it gives us a good indicator of how well that glomerulus is filtering that blood. So whenever we measure our glomerular filtration rate, we take a lot of things into calculation, such as their creatinine clearance level, the patient's gender, their age, their race, and their weight. And that helps us determine that. Now, what is a, GF, a GFR specifically? It is the rate that the glomerulus filters waste, ions, and water in the blood. So it tells us how well the kidneys are performing, specifically that nephron, in helping our body maintain that beautiful homeostasis environment. Now, we want a normal GFR in our patients, and a normal GFR is greater than 90 milliliters per minute. So 90 milliliters per minute or higher is a normal GFR. So in chronic kidney disease, what happens is that that GFR progressively decreases and there's various stages of CKD. And for exams, I would be familiar with the GFR for each stage, especially stage four and five because that's when you have severe loss of renal function because sometimes tests like to ask questions about that. So let's go over this. Okay, stage one is where you have kidney damage with normal renal function. So their GFR is gonna be normal, greater than 90 milliliters per minute, but there's gonna be proteinuria, protein in the urine that has presented for three months or more. Then they can progress to stage two, which is kidney damage with mild loss of renal function with a GFR between 60 to 89 milliliters per minute, and they'll have proteinuria that's been present for three months or more. 
Then stage three is mild to severe loss of renal function with a GFR between 30 to 59 milliliters per minute. And then we go into the really severe stages. Stage four is severe loss of renal function with a GFR between 15 to 29 milliliters per minute. And then the very last stage, which is the worst stage of all, is stage five. And this is end stage renal disease. And this is where the GFR is less than 15 milliliters per minute. And this is where the patient's gonna be getting dialysis regularly and will be a candidate for a kidney transplant. And these stages are sourced from the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease Health Statistics. Therefore, as that GFR is decreasing, the patient is going to have issues. They're gonna have issues with waste, with electrolyte imbalances, and fluid overload. And as you've seen in those stages, as they go from one to five, that GFR is progressively decreasing. So the patient who's in the early stages of chronic kidney disease, they're gonna probably be asymptomatic because that GFR is normal compared to that patient in stage four or five where the GFR is really low. So this is really what we're gonna be concentrating on are those patients who are in the last stages of chronic kidney disease, especially when we're talking about our nursing interventions and things like that. Okay, so when we have a decreased GFR, our glomerulus is not filtering the way it should. So think of it this way. Everything that should be filtered is just staying in the blood and it's just building up because it's not going through here to be dripped down into Bowman's capsule and go through the tubules and the tubule will pick and choose what it wants. So what is going to happen to our waste levels in our body, specifically the BUN which we measure, in, which is urea and creatinine. It's going to increase in our body. So those waste levels are going to be high and this is going to lead to problems such as azotemia, uremia, you're gonna see neurological changes and itching, things like that, which we'll talk in more in depth in our nursing interventions. Then what's gonna to happen to our fluid status issues? Again, the glomerulus is not removing the water it should. So what's gonna to happen to that water? It's gonna stay in the blood. So we're gonna get fluid overload. So we're gonna be hypo or hypervolemic. We're gonna be hypervolemic. Now, what's gonna happen with that? Think about when there's too much water in the blood. We have a lot of pressure in there. Our blood pressure is gonna be high, hypertension. This can cause a lot of pressure on the heart, which can cause it to become weak, which can lead to fluid backing up into the lungs. So pulmonary edema, cardiac issues, things like that. How do you expect their urinary output to be if this glomerulus is not filtering the way it should? Will the urinary output be high or will it be low? It will be low, it'll be decreased. Okay, so let's go over some terms. If their urinary output was less than 400 milliliters per day, what's that term? It's term augluria, okay? If their urinary output was less than 100 milliliters per day, what would that be? That would be anuria. So you'll be seeing some really low urinary output in these patients. Okay, let's go over to fluid and electrolytes. Okay, so glomerulus is not removing the ions it should. So what's it gonna do? Is those ions, electrolytes are gonna stay in the blood. So which electrolytes are gonna be high? Number one, our potassium. And we really care about potassium because it can cause cardiac issues. So we're gonna have hyperkalemia. How's our phosphate levels gonna be? They're also gonna be high as well, along with our magnesium levels. Now, what about calcium levels? Well, remember in our fluid and electrolyte series, if you haven't checked it out, I recommend you do because it'll help you when you're studying this material. Phosphate and calcium have a relationship and they are always the opposite of each other. So whenever you have high phosphate levels, you're gonna have low calcium levels. Now, why is that? Okay, calcium binds to phosphate. So if we have all this phosphate in our blood, it's gonna take the calcium and bind it to itself, which is gonna remove the calcium from our blood. So we'll have hypocalcemia. Now let's take it a step further. What's gonna happen with that? 
Well, whenever your parathyroid gland senses high phosphate levels, it causes the parathyroid gland to release PTH, parathyroid hormone. What does parathyroid horm hormone do? Well, we learned from our endocrine series, it stimulates the bones to release calcium from within itself to go into the blood to increase the blood serum of calcium. Well, what does that do to our bones? It makes them weak and brittle. So keep that in mind for whenever we're talking about nursing interventions. So we're gonna have hyperkalemia, we're gonna have hyperphosphatemia, we're gonna have hypocalcemia, and we're gonna have hypermagnesemia. Okay, now let's look at this, our protein and blood. Okay, our glomerulus, remember, should not filter proteins and blood cells. Well here, in chronic kidney disease, the whole structure is being affected. Not only is our nephron gonna be affected, but here in a second, you're gonna see that this whole kidney, the cells within it that secrete hormones and activate vitamin D are gonna be affected. So, what's getting through? Protein. So the patient will probably have some protein in the urine. And they're probably gonna have blood in the urine as well. So think, what's gonna happen when we're losing all this protein in our urine? Well, we know that albumin, one of those proteins, regulates oncotic pressure. Whenever you have decreased oncotic pressure, it allows fluid within that capillary to leak into that interstitial tissue. So we're gonna get even more swelling and edema. Then, with the hematuria, we're losing red blood cells in our urine. We're gonna get anemia because we're losing blood into the urine. Okay, so now let's talk about our kidneys producing hormones. Because in a lot of patients, if you've ever worked on a dialysis floor, floor renal floor, you're gonna notice these patients have very similar electrolyte imbalances and will have these issues because of what's going on. So. The kidneys produce a hormone called EPO, which is short for erythropoietin. And what does EPO do? It helps create red blood cells in the bone marrow. Well, in CKD, EPO is not being produced like it should. It's gonna be decreased. So we're not producing red blood cells. What are we at risk for? We're at risk for anemia, so the patient can have that. Another hormone the kidneys produce is called renin. Cells within the kidney produce that. And what does renin do? It plays a role in increasing our blood pressure. It maintains our blood pressure for us. So what's happening with the glomerulus? How much water is it filtering? It's not really filtering a lot of water. So those cells sense that and they say, uh-oh, the kidneys aren't filtering a lot of water, that means our blood pressure must be low. So we need to release some renin to increase that blood pressure, which is not a good thing because remember we're already in a hypervolemic state. We already have hypertension going on. So we're gonna release more renin, which is gonna increase our blood pressure even more. And here in a second, when we talk about the causes of this condition, hypertension is one of them. So we're causing even more damage to our kidneys. Okay, and another thing that the kidneys do is kidneys activate vitamin D. And what does vitamin D do? It plays a crucial role in helping our body reabsorb calcium from the food we take in. But with CKD, you're not really activating that vitamin D, so guess what? You're not really going to be reabsorbing that calcium taken from food because we need that vitamin D to help us do that. So they're gonna be, they're gonna experience even more hyper, hypocalcemia, which, Remember, with the high phosphate levels, they're gonna even have even lower calcium levels. So that's gonna be a double whammy with our calcium. Now let's look at the causes of chronic kidney disease. Okay, one cause is diabetes mellitus. And how does this cause this condition? Well, when the patient has uncontrolled hyperglycemia, so they have a lot of glucose in that blood, their blood sugars are running very, very high, this causes glucose to stick to the artery wall. And remember, sugar is sticky, so it sticks to the artery wall, and that causes damage to the arteries that supply the kidneys. So they can develop chronic kidney disease because your kidneys are being deprived of the nutrients it needs to function. Another thing that can cause it is high blood pressure. So the patient has uncontrolled hypertension. And uh, we learned from our hypertension video that hypertension is one of those 
things that happen that causes really no signs and symptoms until it's too late. It's like the silent killer. So a lot of times the patient is unaware that they even have high blood pressure. So there's this constant high pressure hitting those artery walls to the kidneys and, the ki and it becomes damage, which whenever the artery that's feeding the kidney becomes damaged, that's less blood that's gonna go to the kidneys and go to that nephron and cause kidney damage. So these two diseases, these two issues are the most common causes for developing chronic kidney disease. Other causes can include acute kidney injury, acute renal failure, which is what we talked about in the previous video. Maybe they don't progress to the recovery stage of that disease and they progress to chronic kidney disease instead. Polycystic kidney disease, they can develop this and this is a genetic condition where cysts develop in the kidneys causing issues with renal function, infection, or nephrotoxic drugs. Those drugs that are very, very toxic to the kidneys like NSAIDs, aminoglycosides, chemotherapy drugs, or contrast dye for uh, testing procedures. Okay, so what is the treatment for chronic kidney disease? Okay, remember we have various stages. So, in those early stages where that GFR is normal, what is usually ordered is to, for the patient to control their blood pressure and to control their blood glucose level to prevent any further damage to that kidney so they can hopefully preserve that current GFR and not have it decrease anymore. Also, they may prescribe, the physician may prescribe blood pressure medicine to keep that blood pressure low and to help protect the kidneys because there's two groups of medications that they have found that actually provide a protective mechanism to the kidneys and they include ACE inhibitors which are those angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and those are your drugs that end in pril like lisinopril or the ARBs, the angiotensin receptor blockers and these are the drugs that end in sartan, S-A-R-T-A-N like low sartan. And in addition to that, they'll be monitoring their GFR regularly, making sure it's not getting progressively worse, and having the patient monitor their blood pressure and making sure it's staying within a normal range. Now, when they progress or in those advanced stages, like stages three, four, and five, especially that last stage, stage five, where, that, where the GFR is abnormal, the patient may need dialysis on a regular schedule. A lot of patients are like, they have dialysis on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and what is dialysis again? This is really, what it is, is it's a machine that's gonna take the blood and filter it like how the nephron of the kidney should have. So it's gonna remove the excessive water, the waste, and regulate those electrolyte levels. And if it's really, really bad, like in the end-stage renal disease, they, if they're a candidate, they can be a candidate for a kidney transplant. Now let's look at our nursing interventions. Okay, what are we gonna be doing for this patient as the nurse? Well, let's ask yourself, what is going on with this patient with those late stages of chronic kidney disease? Well, they're gonna have a buildup of waste in the blood. They're gonna have anemia, electrolyte imbalances, low urinary output, and fluid overload. So we want to tailor our nursing interventions based on what is going on with the patient. So first, let's talk about the buildup of waste in the blood. The patient's gonna have what's called uremia. And whenever they have this, they will have some specific signs and symptoms. Because remember, our glomerular filtration rate has decreased, so it's not filtering all that waste out it should. So that waste is trying to go somewhere. One thing they can have is itching, and this is due to deposits of urea crystals on the skin, and it's being secreted through the sweat glands. And it has a unique look to it. It'll actually look like this white frost on the skin, and this is known as uremic frost. Another thing the patient can have because of those as, uh, because of those levels really high in the blood, they can have confusion and you need to be assessing their neuro status and they're at risk for injury, falls, so you want to be thinking of safety issues. 
and diet. What type of diet would we want them to follow? We want them to follow a low protein diet because remember, urea is the breakdown of protein in the liver. So we want them to have some protein to prevent muscle wasting, but we don't want them to have high amounts because it's just gonna be broken down into more urea, more waste that our kidneys cannot get rid of. And our blood is gonna become really acidic from all this waste in there. So the blood pH can be less than 7.35 and they're, they can enter into to conditions known as metabolic acidosis. And whenever that happens, you may see what's called cosmal breathing. And these are deep, rapid breaths. And it's the respiratory system of trying to blow off carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is an acid and it's trying to increase the blood pH. So make sure you're watching the respiratory status, counting those respirations. Is it labored? Is it rapid? What's going on? Now, another thing is anemia. And what's anemia again? It's low red blood cells. And what do red blood cells do? Because they're really important in our body. They help transport oxygen to our tissues, to our body, so it can function properly. Now, why are we seeing anemia again? Just a recap, because we have low production of EPO. Remember EPO, erythropoietin, helps stimulate our bone marrow to produce red blood cells, so we're not getting that. Another thing is we can be losing blood through our urine, so that can decrease it even more. Along with being deficient in other minerals, such as iron, folic acid, and vitamin B12, because those substances play a role in helping us produce hemoglobin, which helps transport red blood cells throughout the system. Now your patient, when you look at them, they will be pale, they'll be very tired, they can be short of breath just getting up from the bed to the bedside chair, they get really winded, and they can be confused. So what are some treatments for this that the physician may order? Supplements of iron to help uh, replenish those levels to help produce more red blood cells if they're low in that. Also, erythropoietin shots, EPO shots, and these are given sub-Q, and this will help stimulate that bone marrow to produce red blood cells where your kidneys are not able to stimulate them to do that anymore or a blood transfusion to replace them with some more fresh red blood cells. Okay, another thing we had going on was low urinary output and fluid overload. So anytime we're dealing with fluid issues, what are we always gonna do in any type of patient? We're gonna monitor their intake and output very, very closely. We're also gonna perform daily weights because weighing patient, patients and looking at their weight is a good indicator of fluid retention. So we'll be using the same scale, every day in the morning and we'll be looking at those weights. What's their weight today compared to their weight yesterday? Are they gaining any? Are they losing any? We're gonna assess the swelling status in their extremities, in their legs, in their arms, in their belly, and in their face. Is it going down or is it getting worse? Lung sounds, we're gonna be listening to that because um, when you hear crackles, that can indicate pulmonary edema. So if they're in fluid overload, the heart may be becoming weak, and so it's allowing fluid to stay into the lungs or flow over into the lungs. We're gonna monitor the blood pressure because we wanna keep their blood pressure at a normal range because remember, high blood pressure is really hard on those kidneys. And assessing the respiratory status, again, that goes back to the fluid overload. Another thing that may be ordered by the physician is a fluid restriction because we want to watch their urinary output really closely and make sure that we're not just giving them or allowing them to have so much fluids compared to what their kidneys can actually put out. So it'll be based on what the physician orders with that. And a low sodium diet because sodium loves water. So the more sodium they have in their system because they're not really excreting the sodium as they should, that draws more water into the vascular system, which can increase the blood pressure even more. Along with other diet restrictions, which we're gonna talk about whenever we go over our fluid and electrolyte problems. And again, one of those electrolyte imbalances the patient can have is called hyperkalemia, where you have a high potassium level. And the potassium level can be higher than 5.1 milliequivalents per liter. And what is a normal potassium level? 3.5 to 5.1 milliequivalents per liter. That's where we want them. Now, the reason potassium is so important is because it plays a role in muscle contraction. 
And what's happened is that there has been a decreased ability on the nephron's part to filter and excrete that potassium. So the patient is at risk for a cardiac event. So we really want to monitor their EKG, have them on a bedside monitor, and we're looking at that EKG specifically for any tall peaked T waves like this one right here. Also, the QRS com complex can widen, as you can see right here, and your PR interval can get long. So be looking at that. But most tests, they like to ask about this T wave. Remember, it's going to be tall and peaked. Okay. On the nurse's part, you'll want to be restricting those foods that are rich in potassium. And that includes foods like potatoes, avocados, strawberries, bananas, spinach, and oranges. And in my fluid and electrolyte videos, if you're wanting to know foods that are really rich in the certain substances, go to that series or on the website because I have mnemonics on how to remember those foods. So check that out. And the physician may order k which will, um, you can give it orally or rectally, and it will take that potassium and excrete it out of the body. Another thing that electrolyte imbalance they can have is, remember that hyperphosphatemia where they have a high phosphate level, and that's greater than 4.5 milligrams per deciliter, and normal FOS level is 2.5 seven to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. And what is that gonna to do to our calcium level when phosphate's high? Because remember, phosphate likes to bind with calcium. It's gonna decrease our calcium level. So we're gonna get hypocalcemia, and that is a level less than 8.6 milligrams per deciliter. And you usually want your calcium levels between 8.6 to 10 milligrams per deciliter. And again, this is because that nephron is damaged, so that phosphate has increased in the blood. And it's binded with calcium and brought that level down. And what's another reason why we're having low calcium levels? Because of that decreasability of activating vitamin D by the kidneys, because we're not going to be reabsorbing as much calcium as we should. So what happens, this patient is definitely at risk for some bone issues because again, just to recap, that high phosphate level stimulates the parathyroid gland to produce PTH, parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone stimulates the bones to release calcium into the blood to increase the serum calcium level. Well, doing that, it hurts bone health. So they're at risk for injury. And so you wanna prevent that. So what do physicians order to help bring those phosphate levels down? Because we want those normal so it doesn't deplete our calcium levels anymore. Phosphate binders, and this will help decrease phosphate. And some drugs are calcium carbonate or calcium acetate, also known as phospho. And what these drugs do is they bind with the phosphate in the foods and it excretes the phosphate in the stool. So ask yourself, when is the best time to give a patient their calcium carbonate or phospho? right with meals, like five minutes before meals, or immediately after, because we want them to take it with food because it's working on the food that they're taking that has phosphate in it, so it can excrete it out of the stool. So you want to give it with that. And they want to follow a low phosphate diet. So this will be to restrict flu foods like poultry, fish, dairy products, nuts, especially your canned sodas that have phosphate in them, and oatmeal. Next, patient is at risk for hypermagnesemia. And this is a high magnesium level. And the level can be greater than 2.6 milligrams per deciliter. And we like our mag levels in between 1.6 to 2.6 milligrams per deciliter. And when you have a high magnesium level, it's usually because you have a low calcium level because those go hand in hand as we learn in our fluid and electrolyte series. And with this, the patient's tendon reflexes will be diminished or completely absent depending on how high that magnesium level is and they can be lethargic. So what you wanna remember with this is you want to not give them any magnesium-based antacid or laxatives because you're just giving them more magnesium and you want to make sure you're restricting those foods high in magnesium. Also, the physician 
may order IV calcium to help decrease this level because as we replenish the calcium level, our mag level will come back down to normal. Okay, so that wraps up this video on chronic kidney disease. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.